the message is like, you can start building in Orbit today, right now. There's like no excuses. If you are passionate about Orbit, like now is like the time to start building things. All right, everybody, what's going on? This is the Other Life Podcast. I am Justin Murphy. This episode is one in a whole series all about Orbit. Orbit is a whole new computing and networking paradigm that many of you know I've become very interested in in recent months, really recent years, the past couple of years or so. I think Urbit is just way crazier and way cooler than most people realize. I think a lot of people are sleeping on Urbit and just don't really know about what's going on with it, what it is, and all the cool badass people building Urbit, building things on Urbit, creating on Urbit. And so now the development of the technology is really picking up and moving faster. I decided that when the Urbit annual conference came to town in Austin this past October, that I would sit down with 10 different people all across the network, people who are building the technology, people who are creating on the network, and people just in this culture that still I think a lot of people don't know much about. So I can honestly say this was one of the most interesting experiences I ever had at any kind of conference, to be perfectly honest. I spoke with CEOs, I spoke with engineers, I spoke with e-girls from weird theory Twitter. Like I'm not talking about Instagram chicks, I'm talking about like weird theory girls in you know the other life neck of the woods of of the the twitterverse and the blogosphere i talked with skitzed out writers and post everything podcasters and very possibly i spoke even with an alien uh, i'm only half kidding it was just wild man it was really really wild a really really interesting set of characters you're about to meet over the next 10 episodes and i'm just super pumped to bring this series out into the world so Real quick, before I forget, I do want to let you know if you're interested in Urbit, it's now easier than ever to get onto the network. So I actually have a bunch of Urbit planets, aka Urbit ships, pretty much uh, computers in the cloud, an individual computer in the cloud that can be yours. It also functions as your identity, and it's what you use to log onto the network and to use Urbit. So if you want to, I'll give you one. Uh, I have a bunch, and any listener of the show, I want to get you on Urbit. So um, you can just go to imperceptible.computer. I made a whole site just for this purpose. And yeah, drop your email and uh, I will get you a planet, aka an Urbit ship. All right. Um, depending on whether you're listening to this now or two years from now, uh, there may or may not be some kind of uh, modest fee associated with it. Uh, right now, I'm just giving them out for free. You don't need to have any coding or programming skills or experience whatsoever. It's very straightforward. I will give you your own planet and you'll be on the network playing around talking to people in five minutes, probably. Okay. That's imperceptible.computer. I will put a link in the show notes. That's all from me. Let me get out of the way and on to the show. All right, Nika, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, of course. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. So you have a very interesting company that's building products on Urbit and Cardano and Solana. So that's kind of an interesting portfolio of, <laughs> of, of bets that you're making there. And I want to unpack the hypotheses behind all of those, actually. But since we're here for the weekend over the Urbit conference, we, I figure we might as well start there. And I think the first thing I'd love to ask you is just if you could share with us at a high level, just in general terms, what is your Urbit bull thesis? Like what got you into Urbit? What made you confident enough in Urbit as an ecosystem to be allocating a lot of effort to building products on what a lot of people see as really still a quite a nascent uh, project and and quite uh, quite an early bet in a way? How do you see the bull case for Urbit? Yeah, so it's like super interesting because uh, I went to some meetups and I didn't fully get Urbit and sometimes more about like, who explains something to you and if they explain in just same terms. And one of my co-founders, uh, Rob, has been in the Urbit like, uh, community for two years. And he was the one that actually convinced me and because he understands how I think. He was able to explain it in a way that I understand because I'm like technical, but also I'm like very based to products. So it's not only something that's cool technically or very uh, difficult, but also how can that apply to like real products. And when he was able to explain to me uh, really clearly, like, for example, that Orbit is good for identities, storage, and processing in a way that's decentralized and you have ownership of your uh, your own things, it's, like, super interesting. And then, like, okay, but why don't we do this in blockchain? And we start, like, talking and then, like, oh, it doesn't make sense. It needs to have a completely different approach. Blockchain is not, like, this one thing that works for everything. And the approach that Orbit took uh, to... Uh, uh, achieve these goals, like, I think it's the right one. It makes so much sense. And it was like that moment that I was like, oh, holy crap, this makes sense. And, like, and then like, I started like reading more and more. And uh, we decided to like actually make it 
uh, part of our core um, core value proposition, like develop a stuff for Orbit. Okay, interesting. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of the popular critiques of Orbit, right? People will say it's too slow and it's never going to be fast enough to really work. Perhaps people say it will never scale for different reasons. People sometimes say that Hoon is just way too hard to learn and it's so unfriendly to developers that it's never going to take off. These are common critiques that people make. But as someone who's building a company that's building on top of Urbit, you must be fairly unconvinced of these critiques. You must believe that Urbit is going to win because you're allocating time and resources and, and developer hours to building on top of Urbit. So what do you say to those critiques? Like, how do you see, how do you see the haters on Urbit? And why do you not believe in the critiques and the haters? Uh, yeah, I, I I think like a lot of people like just look at the picture, how things are right now. And sometimes that's like also a problem from like uh, engineers and I'm an engineer myself. I study electronic engineering and also study industrial engineering. And sometimes like we want to break things right away. And it's like, oh, that's a problem, another problem, another problem. Like mission accomplished, this thing, it's not going to go anywhere. But if you think about other things like this thing called Bitcoin, like, oh, it's too slow, it's not going to scale up, blah, blah, blah. Or like electric electrical cars, like too slow. Uh, where are you going to get energy? It's like, and you need to start like putting things in perspective. Like, okay, uh, the first things like a proof of concept, and then you need to start thinking how this can scale up. Is there like any way that this could like speed up? Because uh, once you achieve like something that you see like value, things are only going to get better. It's like they're not going to get stuck. So I think like there is enough space and like the infrastructure and how things are being put together in Arvid that uh, actually this uh, could scale up. So you think that's basically all just FUD and it will be figured out over time, but people are skeptical of anything that's particularly ambitious. Is that kind of what you think? Yeah, and uh, mostly it's about the team that's behind. Like you are always going to have problems with everything. And uh, even like transistors like oh how are you going to even like think of having a computer this is like so slow they're like, too big and so i have seen so many technologies that have started like a thing that they shouldn't scale but if you have like the right people behind you're always going to be able to like scale up you just need to have like the right foundations okay so you see the foundations of urbit being sufficiently strong enough that the other things are relatively second order and will be figured out over time yeah especially because i'm coming from like the blockchain space and like, for example, Bitcoin could do like around five transactions per second. And it's going to replace money or it's going to be a store of value. And with five transactions per second, how? And like, right. and a lot of like things that were like scaling up uh, through time. And I'm a huge Bitcoin believer. And like, it took me some time. Uh, some of my friends were working with Bitcoin back in, I think, 2011. They put like a crypto chain in Chile called uh, Trade Hill. And they tried to explain to me like, oh, I don't get it because again, uh, they were not communicating like a technical way that I will understand. And then another friend like that actually understood Bitcoin explained to me and like, I got it. But uh, yeah, I have seen like these things so many times. So like, I just look at uh, the infrastructure and how things are fought. And if they make sense, like our problems are going to be solved along the way. Okay, fascinating. And as an engineer, when you first started looking into Urbit in detail and evaluating it as a system to potentially work on and work with, was there anything from an engineering perspective that you found particularly exciting or particularly compelling where you were like, oh, wow, this is awesome. We we need to start working on this. Yeah, I think it was like just that uh, usually you tackle one problem at a time. Identity. Okay, let's solve identity. Let's put like uh, a token, like an NFT in the blockchain, and you can track that. But uh, for Orbit, it was like identity, processing and storage and like if it's not too much and it's not just too little it's like i think it's like the right amount to do like things differently and having like an operation system that uh is like not tied to anything i think it's like super interesting so it's different enough that i don't know i just get like super excited about like all the possibilities of things that we can start building okay fascinating and we should talk about some of those possibilities maybe we start with a product that dc spark just released which is called Urbit Visor, yeah. which I believe, if I understand it correctly, it's basically a, a browser plugin, like a Chrome extension that allows you to use your Urbit identity as a kind of login or a credential for other systems. Is that a fair way to summarize it? Or how would you explain Urbit Visor? And then more importantly, what is the real kind of hypothesis behind it? Like what what 
what went into the decision to focus on this product now? Yeah, so uh, maybe I can come here to like two different ways. So uh, in my previous company, we developed a wallet uh, for Cardano called Yoroi. Uh, Yoroi got to have over 500,000 users. We were securing around like $8 billion in a non-custodial way. And so uh, it was like interesting to be able to send and receive tokens and stuff like that. But when people and when we started seeing like cool stuff, if, when we extended to be able to like connect with uh, websites, uh, these are dApps. And this is also something that has happened in other ecosystems, like even like way more developed, like in Ethereum, you're seeing in Solana. And this connects to uh, two different paradigms. One that for normal users, if I want to use an app, is it going to be a desktop app or is it going to be in the web? And uh, some things, I have like an opinion on other things like, I cannot change how people think. Like I just need to like uh, go in the same direction. And at least for me, like people, they don't download apps for the desktop anymore. If you want to use something, you go to like a website, even like apps like that were like so, so deep and so specific, like Photoshop or like, and now all are like web base and updates are better and like just like this entire ecosystem uh built on top of browsers like pretty amazing and that's why i think it made sense to like uh try to go in the same direction as like what we have seen uh in general which is like that uh the apps are going to be developing web most of the developers work in web so let's uh try to make it easier for them and that's why we came up uh, with orbit visor uh which mostly was an idea uh, uh, coming from one of my co-founders and he was explaining to me and it made sense to me. And so uh, Orbit Visor, uh, you have your Orbit, uh, your chip, and you have a website. And if you don't have Orbit Visor, how do you communicate? Uh, maybe they're going to have access to everything. So Orbit Visor is basically this like sort of firewall that's between a website and your Orbit. So you can control what information you give to the website. And also the website can have like a specific API that's going to be really helpful for developers to extract like specific information. So in a very simplistic way, for example, we have Facebook login for some website. So through Orbit Visor, developers can also understand the concept, oh, I can use Orbit as an identity system that can replace Facebook login, and it's like super simple. I use this API, and you as a user, you're going to be sure they're not going to be reading extra information that you don't want to because, again, Orbitvisor works like this, like pretty good firewall. Right. Okay. Now, isn't isn't MetaMask kind of already becoming that in a way? A lot of people use MetaMask as essentially a login for Web3 dApps, right? So did you think about that at all? Like, why would someone want to start using Orbit ID as their preferred login when they can use MetaMask for other things. Like if there's going to be a convergence and a kind of network effect on a, a universal login, doesn't it kind of look like MetaMask is is far in the lead? Why why would people use Urbit? How are people going to converge around Urbit being that universal login? I love this question. <laughs> so uh, MetaMask, uh, I think is something amazing and like uh, no one was expecting that we'll grow this much, I think it, right now it's like close to 7 million users, if you look at the Chrome store. And so, uh, okay, some of the issues about MetaMask is that how it works is that basically uh, it signs with your public key a message so they can be assured that you are the owner of that specific address. But again, it only works for like Ethereum. So I'm at least I'm of the vision that there's not going to be a one blockchain takes all. And I call this like the Netflix moment a little bit. Uh, what do this means? That if someone is watching a movie in Netflix and you ask the person like, uh, what server are they using uh, to stream this movie? They're going to say like, I don't know and I don't care. I just want to watch the movie. And uh, right now we have seen in Ethereum that there are like different ways to scale up. Uh, we have Arbitrum, Optimism, and other ones are coming up with our base in CK rollup, which is like uh, zero knowledge proof but they still need to solve some issues. So it's going to be like more of like a medium term solution, but there's going to be like multiple solutions. And also there is not even Ethereum, there is like Cosmos, Polkadot, Solana, Cardano. So in my life, I have never seen like, in, at least in tech, one winner takes all. There's always like alternatives. And I think this is going to happen with blockchain. There's not going to be like a one winner takes all. Also, I don't think there's a space for 20 or 30 blockchains, but there is going to be a few. And for that, you're going to need like 
something that's not so linked to just one layer solution that only use like signing of one specific like address that's like embedded to, for example, Ethereum layer one, or even like Ethereum layer one specific layer two, something that's agnostic to all of that, that's like orbit, basically. Okay, fascinating. So if you believe in a multi-chain future, then you might believe that Urbit has the best chance at being the common denominator identity system. Exactly, because it's not tied to any specific blockchain and it, it was built up from that vision, like something separately that's not dependent on a specific blockchain. Okay, fascinating. So something you just said was that in tech, you don't often see winner takes all outcomes, but certainly in some domains you do, right? So like obviously Google owns search, right? So how do you think through, how do you think about that in that why in some domains you do see winner takes all like Google owning search, but in the, the blockchain universe, you suspect that it won't be winner take all. Like what, what are the conditions under which it is winner takes all and the conditions under which it's not? Okay. So that's a great question. And sometimes it's about the scope and uh, you can think of like Google uh, and I'm going to be picky here. Google as the website. I uh, not Alphabet, that's the company. Right. I don't think Google's like the clear winner because for example, if you are in social media, you don't look at social media stuff in Google. Or for example, if you want to look for videos, you go to YouTube and you search for videos in YouTube. If you want to even look for things in blockchain, you don't go to Google, you go to, uh, I don't know, a blog explorer. If you want to find apps for your phone, you go to Google Play or App Store. So, right. so and those are huge, huge markets that continue growing. And so uh, I think like you, you, there's maybe uh, they're like pretty big, but still there's like this huge market that Google couldn't like take over. And that's what I was. Uh, that makes sense. So it sounds like you, what you're saying is what's crucial is kind of the level of generality. And so at a very high level of generality, there's going to be multiple big players. So if you think about like the internet revolution as a whole, there were many big players, Amazon, Google, you know, uh, a whole bunch, right? So that's not winner take all. But if you go drill down into something specific like web search, you can kind of say Google was the winner that took all, but that's at a very uh, fine grained level of application. So maybe it's the same in the blockchain world. Would that be the implication of, of your thinking? And by that, I mean, there will be chains that are specialized and there might be winner take all dynamics with respect to particular applications. So maybe like there'll be a winner takes all dynamic with the blockchain that specializes on speed, for instance. Maybe there's one that just crushes on speed. Yeah. And for all applications that require speed, that's going to be the winner takes all blockchain. But it's such a massive revolution that there's going to be many domains in which there can be winner takes all outcomes. So that would lead to a multi-chain universe. Is that fair to a summary of your of your perspective? Yeah. And I have some like a small thesis that uh, obviously they probably going to expand, but for example, Bitcoin, I think, is the clear winner in their space. I think it's the only cryptocurrency right now that's like, uh, if a current tries to take over, this is the only one that's actually uh, decentralized enough. Mm -hmm. And decentralization is not just about like how many miners do you have, but also like who updates the code? How do you push for updates? Right now, if you will like froze the code base of every blockchain uh, out there, I think the only one that's like already like a product, like a 1.0, like, uh, good to go is Bitcoin. And, but also uh, for the smart contracts and stuff that, for example, even Orbit is uh, using, uh, they're in Ethereum. So Ethereum is like this other paradigm. Uh, it's like uh, obviously not as decentralized as Bitcoin and has another value pro proposition, but also it's not perfect because it's not fast enough. And that's why there's so many projects working in uh, layer two solutions, or even there's like other blockchains that are like trying to take another approach like Solana or Avalanche. And uh, for example, Solana is so fast, so cheap, but it has a uh, trade-off. Right. And those trade-offs are related to the centralization. For example, to run a validator in Solana, you need a, a server that at least has, like, uh, for validation, 126 gigs of RAM. And to have, like, an actual validator that is going to be, like, uh, creating blocks, at least 256. That's, like, not your average computer, and you need, like, special equipment for that. So... Uh, you have trade off, and that's what I was referring to. Even there is also the case that maybe you want a specific blockchain that's going to be like more about privacy focus. So, those are already right. cases that I think could help the case that I'm saying that there's not going to be one winner takes all. Okay. 
makes a lot of sense. That's fascinating. Now, it's very intriguing to me that DC Spark is building on Urbit, Solana, and Cardano. This is just a kind of fascinating uh, portfolio of bets that you don't often see together. As you might be aware, currently, I would say among the most influential people in the Urbit network, there are a lot of Bitcoin maxis. I don't know if you're aware of this or if you've encountered this, have you? Yeah. Um, but there's definitely a lot of people who disagree with that perspective for sure. Um, but I've never, I don't think I've met anyone who's really super long on Urbit and super long on Cardano. So I'm just super curious, <laughs> What is there a connection there? Like, what, how do you see Cardano, first of all? You know, I'm sure you're aware a lot of people are very critical of Cardano in, in crypto. A lot of people call it vaporware. A lot of people call it way overvalued. They don't ship enough. And a lot of people really make fun of Cardano. So what? give us give us the bull thesis um, for Cardano, if you would. And then I'm super curious to learn like what unites the maybe Urban and Cardano or what the common elements of your of your kind of uh, long position on those two are. Yeah, so basically, uh, I love risk and I love to manage risk. What, and also, I'm like a curious person. How do you mix these things? So I like to take uh, to check things that have like different approaches, like completely different approaches. And that's why... You see, like, we are involved with, like, Cardano, uh, Solana, and Orbit. And even, like, you could make a case that us, we are involved with Ethereum, and I can explain that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm curious because I'm, um, like, some things could work out, some other things can work out. And uh, so that's why we have, like, a kind of, like, different approach. There are, like, other blockchains that are, like, just some, like, nice improvements here or there. So I don't think they're, like, weird enough to have, like, uh, a a case that could grow up okay. uh, and basically that's like the high level uh, thing. So I think most of the blockchains, again, except for Bitcoin, uh, they need to prove themselves. So all of them, they're like, I cannot make like a huge bull case. Like this is going to be what is going to be here. This is going to stay, but rather like, but maybe this is going to work out or maybe not, but we want to already have exposure and right. we want to put more if it's working out and maybe we want to, uh, roll back a little bit if it's not working so much and we're going to put more effort sure. in other uh, e ecosystems. Okay, and what and what is the unique weird vision of Cardano that you feel is the asymmetric bet? Uh, yeah, uh, so basically it's like the way that a different ecosystems are built. Like as I was mentioning before, it's like about the foundations. And I'm not like saying this is the right way, but actually like it's a very different approach that make it, uh, may work out. And for example, for Ethereum, I think it's like hackers that are like trying to come up with code. It's super interesting because usually they will like hack their way in, at least that's what used to happen. And they will write, for example, the yellow paper. And even if you look at the two, sometimes the implementation will differ a little bit. And that's just the way that it goes. Like they go like fast. And even for example, with Plasma, uh, they came out with this like approach to like scalability. And along the way, they realized that wasn't the right way to go because you will need like a specific like uh, like sort of users to protect themselves uh, with data availability, but it wouldn't work out so much with like protocols like, for example, Uniswap. And then they uh, moved back and they came out with rollups, which is like a great solution. I think it takes like the right trade-off. And even with like CK rollups, I think it's going to be like uh, an amazing solution. But then uh, for Cardano, how is this different? Uh, it has more of like a kind of academic approach. Let's like write uh, some like, proof, some formula. So I think it's like a complete, it feels different and actually has been different. Obviously, like sometimes uh, with my background as an engineer, I prefer to go like really fast, but at the end, like not everything needs to be like the way that I personally prefer. So I got interested in like, uh, how is this approach going to work? It's like so different from what I used to do. And usually it's like people that have like two PhDs and stuff like that. So let's see how it goes. And they have come with like interesting stuff, like for example, Ouroboros, which was like the first probably secure uh, proof of stake. And uh, so, so far, like uh, the part of the consensus has been like really interesting. So I'm, see, I'm like expecting to see how Plurus and their smart contract platform is going to evolve. But again, that's why we are more of like a risk management company that we see like different blockchains with different approaches. And for example, it wouldn't be crazy for us that uh, maybe we could end up building on top of like the Lightning Network, which is like completely different from all the other things. Okay, so it sounds like you just have a very nimble attitude and prepared to switch bets as as needed. Yeah. So is there a reason though? I'm just curious why is there a reason why you see Cardano as the the best bet for a competitor on the layer one? Like 
Obviously, there are others. Obviously, you're interested in Solana, but people might cite whatever, you know, um, Polkadot or Avalanche or whatever. There are obviously lots of uh, competitors to Ethereum at the layer one. Is there is there something about Cardano that makes you feel like it's more likely to be the ETH killer if there is going to be one? Or is it just the fact that it's it's it has a very different approach and a very different style? So you like the kind of uncorrelated nature of it? Uh, so... Maybe this is like super nerdy, but let's see how it goes. Like, uh, it needs to be weird enough, right? And most of the other approaches, they use like what is called account-based model. Well, in Bitcoin, as you know, they are UTXO based. So I thought Cardano was really interesting that, okay, let's grab UTXO and let's extend it uh, to run a smart contract using UTXO. So that was like the part that got me really interested. Like, oh, because I actually love UTXOs and I think like Bitcoin, the first blockchain entity, Oh my God, how they nail everything like right away. And I think like uh, using the nonce with like a campaign is like kind of tricky and we have seen some problems. And I think like UTX are like so cool. They're like way, way more difficult to think about. And I think that could be like one of the difficulties in Cardano that when you're creating protocols with UTX source, uh, it's not just about the programming language that you code. That's like based on Haskell, but also like thinking about uh, UTXO, which is really complex. So I don't know how it's going to work out that part, but that's why the UTXO part is like what also make Cardano like completely different than the other ones. Okay, fascinating. Let's let's pause on that for a minute because people listening might not know. So you're, ta- you're talking about UTXOs, right? Which yes. that, that's kind of the the system for uh, kind of accounting transactions. Yeah, I can exp- right? give it ex- Yeah, why don't you example. unpack it? And then I'd like to learn more about how Cardano thinks about that differently because I'm not fully aware of that. So let's, okay. let's unpack so, it. Uh, for the understanding these two different account-based um, models, uh, the first one works like, for example, when you go to a supermarket and you're going to pay something that's like $38. And maybe you have 40 bucks. So you give 40 bucks to the cashier and they're going to give you change. That's going to be two dollars, and maybe even like the forty bucks was like two twenties. So uh, a UTXO will be like one twenty, and then another UTXO will be like the other twenty, and they will be like kind of unique because if you you can say like uh, all the different bills are like fungible, but I mean like the physical bills like a real thing that you need to give away, right? Uh, that you have in your wallet, but uh, account based like a little bit different because it works more like uh, a bank account. So for example, if I want to transfer you $38, I just transfer you $38 and I don't have the change. Okay. So what you're saying is UTXO is basically, it's like every transaction is its own entity. Uh, every like single bill. Every single coin. bill, right, every, right? Like every coin has a history in Bitcoin, right? And you can kind of track and measure the history of that, of that unit basically, right? That's UTXO. Uh, yeah. Uh, Am I getting in there right? Yeah. Uh, give or take, yeah. And and so the account based go into that a little bit more. How is that different? What does that look like? Uh, and and why does it why does that difference matter? Okay, so it's for terms of scalability. So for uh, UTXO, you need to know like uh, to uh, that you need to be able to like create enough UTXOs in a protocol or uh, like consume enough UTXOs uh, from everyone. So sometimes like it needs to be like a little bit more like deterministic. Uh, while for like account base is like or like uh, just send stuff to like a bank account and then you uh, can pop up stuff in the other way. Okay. So uh, one is like uh, I, it gets into complications for like scalability other stuff, but okay. also at the same time give you like more f- fine control about things. Okay, but Cardano's account based system is fundamentally different than all of the others. Uh, it builds on top of what I was created in Bitcoin. Okay. Okay. Interesting. But basically, you see it as a significant enough of a departure that it's 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 uh, novel enough and interesting enough and different enough that it could possibly be like a game changer. Yeah, it can be like its own thing. So basically, those are like the different bets. And but again, uh, we need to see how it works out because it's not only about the tech or like the research and the implementation of the tech, but also adoption. Sure, sure. Okay, that was good. That was a good little detour because I, I didn't know much about that. And I, I think you explained it well, assuming that I was understanding it correctly. No, yeah, I think you, yeah, I got it. Okay, right, excellent. So talk to me a little bit more about how you see the future of products on Urbit. I'm interested, 
because you're taking a, an approach, I would say that's very different than maybe the the conventional wisdom within Orbit. Within Orbit, people are thinking mostly about how to build apps within like landscape, let's say, yeah. or the grid, the new uh, software distribution interface. You chose a very different approach, which is basically building out using the Orbit identity system to build outside of Orbit and to kind of extend Orbit's reach into other systems. Do you think that that's like the future of of Orbit? Is this like a fundamental kind of uh, disagreement with the focus on building within Orbit? Do you think that um, the most exciting avenue moving forward is all the stuff you're going to be able to do with your Orbit ID uh, outside of Orbit? Um, talk to me about like the, the future of how you see that unfolding. Yeah, I and mean, uh, I like to like see like different approaches and how they grow. And uh, this approach is completely different to landscape. So again, it's like, oh, let's try this thing and how it goes. But uh, I'm like sort of like optimizing for what I have seen and what is our thesis about interoperability. And it could be interoperability uh, with Solana or without Solana or with Ethereum or not, doesn't matter. As we discussed, maybe there's going to be multiple ones. So uh, that also includes like, uh, for example, identity, when you are using like a specific tool, a specific product, and for that uh, using Orbit, it will be through the web because that's what most of the dApps in blockchain use, like the web. So that's why like to be part of the party, you need to go to where all the other like cool kids are. I still I think it's like pretty cool to have landscape to, so you have ownership because uh, sometimes, I don't know, uh, I think of when you want to have a cold storage in Bitcoin and you want to use like, I don't know, a computer that has never been connected to the internet, you grab the internet out, you put like a CD-ROM with like uh, Ubuntu that uh, puts up in like memory and like you use everything that's like really encapsulated. So sometimes you want to like do that. You want to like not depend on the web. You want to have like some security uh, assurances that only like through landscape maybe you're going to be able to get. But at the same time, I think like most of the users and most of the adopter maybe is going to want to have like a one solution for everything like blockchain, cryptocurrency, right. and NFTs. And so I think you mentioned earlier in the conversation, you alluded to other products and applications that you kind of imagine in this direction. I would love to hear a little bit more about are there, what are the next products that you would think about for Urbit specifically? Do you think there are particularly exciting opportunities that someone someone should be building X or Y or Z on the Urbit ecosystem? And if so, what would they be if you could share? Uh, yeah, there's like so many like uh, cool stuff to do. And uh, I think it's, you have the identity part that would like kind of like straightforward to understand, but there is only one like about ownership of your data. And right now, like, uh, a lot of our data is not owned by us. We right. feel like we own them, but we don't do right. it at all. And I think, that, for example, even my emails, I don't own my emails. I can get it out of them. Or for example, uh, there is an app that I love that's called Pocket, which every time that I want to like read something and I don't have to save to Pocket, save to Pocket. And sometimes like the website go offline or something happens and like, oh, I, I didn't read that. I wonder why did I miss? And I think like uh, we are in this like specific philosophy that everything's like in the cloud and Orbit's like this contrarian thought that's like so amazing. That's like, okay, let's regain ownership of like our identity or data. And I think like more stuff related to data to happen. And we, when you have data, sometimes you want to do some processing and that also could play really nice with everything that's related to the operation system from Orbit. And do you suspect that those companies, if they emerge doing those types of products, is that also going to be built kind of outside of Orbit, but using Orbit, kind of like Orbit Visor? Or do you see the data, this kind of data opportunity as more within Orbit? Uh, this is my opinion, and obviously I can yeah. be wrong, but my bet will be like outside landscape because it needs to connect with other things. For example, uh, what do you use for Twitter? Or what do you use for Gmail? Or what do you use for like navigating the web? It's going to be like, uh, not landscape. Uh, it will be like, do you bring Orbit to the internet or do you bring like every other app to like landscape? And one is going to be way more effort than the other one. One is going to be like a thousand times more effort. So right. I, I think like the other one is like a faster approach. And also I, I really like Orbit and I want people to understand and take an advantage uh, and like be able to use it. So I think like the faster that we can bring like solutions and uh, like real use cases 
uh, for people to understand all of it. It's going to grow the ecosystem, not only with users, but also with developers that are going to be building all their cool stuff. Right. So I think a lot of people listening to this will be surprised to even know that there are real companies being built on Urbit. Like yesterday, we talked with Terrell. I don't know if you know those guys, Logan and Christian, but um, they're a startup that recently launched and they're building payment rails on Urbit. And there are now a good handful of companies, I believe, being built on Urbit. And DC Spark is, is another one that's building on Urbit. What has the experience been like built, building building a company around Urbit? Because a lot of people see Urbit as, as you know a real kind of long shot. People see it as still really quite early and not ready yet are the kinds of critiques that you hear. So what was it like you know, pitching investors and trying to kind of communicate this vision to Urbit? Just, I think people would be curious to know just what is the experience like trying to build an actual company that's using Urbit? Yeah. Uh... I uh, know it's kind of funny because uh, usually the first question is like, "How do you spell Orbit?" <laughs> <laughs> like uh, they, uh, it's like such a new concept, different, and sometimes people are like, "I don't fully get it." I trust you on this one, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think sometimes it's like better to show than to tell, and that's what we want to be trying to do. Like, okay, uh, we have built all the cool stuff. You think like uh, we like get to build like interesting things trust me on this one give us like a few months we're going to start building products that are going to make sense to you and that was one of the things that we tried to come out with orbit visor like okay quick win and now that we have orbit visor we want to work in some two or three other uh, implementations using orbit and like have all quick wins so uh, people can actually uh, see it and test it like okay uh, this how it makes sense because a lot of the people's like Okay, I think I understand the concept, but how do you use it? Right. And if you don't have concrete examples, they they never like get out from like this like high level. And if you show them uh, like, oh, this is like Facebook logic, boom, I get it. Oh, this is like to save your data, like pocket. And if even if websites go off, you're going to have your data. Boom, I get it. So right. okay. we want I want to like show people through those examples. And can you share what's on the roadmap for you all and what concretely you plan to be building after Urban Advisor or, or is that kind of more private? That's fine if, if it's more private. Uh, we're still like bouncing different ideas okay. and we're like super excited, but uh, we want to be part of like the ecosystem, like in like maybe helping like with some uh, specific APIs improvements or like how to, uh, uh, like from our perspective, I think Plon has done an amazing job. And, but uh, like, just like feedback, oh, uh, from outside, these are the things that maybe we could like small things that we could improve. Or also like, for example, what is something that everyone in the community is using so we can get like some users that can play with this. So we are thinking about doing something with Twitter. So, okay, cool. Interesting. I think my final questions would maybe just be around practical uses and like who should be using Herb Advisor and what can you do with it now? Tell us a little bit about what concretely it can offer people and why people should start using it. Yeah, so right now, like we also created this other thing called uh, Orbit Dashboard that it has like most of like the tools that uh, you can find uh, in like landscape. So uh, this is like a proof of concept of how things can like work out and like sometimes like pretty nice to have like things on the web because also you as a developer can code like using the different paradigms from the web, like the different frameworks and uh, things could like maybe uh, look like more shiny right away and you don't focus so much in like sometimes reinventing the wheels with some frameworks or how like work with the UI and you just can take advantage of everything that was already built UI wise in the web. Right. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And what, what else does uh, Urbit uh, dashboard do? So uh, for example, uh, you can have already statistics about your messages. You can have access to like uh, the console and you can up, uh, uh you can uh, execute a scry and some other things so and that's all in the browser yeah okay fascinating yeah i, I haven't i haven't set that up yet but I, I, that's interesting to me and with urban advisor what what kinds of things can you log into with it like anything or what uh right now we have like uh all the different permissions like uh, scope out and if you go to our github everything's like open source and again uh thank you so much to the orbit foundation to help us uh like finance this and yeah, uh, we have all the different scopes. So you can like, uh, as a developer, ask for specific permissions and like work with that information. But uh, basically right now, Orbit Advisor is like this firewall that 
uh, protects your information from like what developers could like be getting through their websites. Okay, so is it like the platforms that you want to use it with? They have to kind of engineer an integration, or yeah. so. Okay, so that's going to take time over time, I guess, to get platforms to offer that integration. Uh, I could take some time, but we are making it as easy as possible because also like Orbit is like a really good project. It's really technical, but also uh, that makes it like sometimes difficult for developers to understand. Okay, <laughs> where do I look? Where? Uh, how do I integrate? But with the API from Orbit Visors, way easier to get access to some of the things from Orbit. So we actually expect that uh, the adoption rate for like apps using Orbit is going to uh, be faster. And we, because the API is way more simple and it's the language that uh, web developers understand. And uh, we will see how it goes. But also in the meanwhile, we are creating examples and other projects that are going to be using the same thing that we are building. Okay, interesting. So what would your message be to to the world and to the audience, are you looking for like engineers to build integrations for Urban Advisor? Is that like a, something that you want to see more of, or for individuals who just want to use Urban as their identity? Like, um, if I were to add it to my browser today, like, could I could I do things with it? Uh, so the message would be like, sometimes a lot of people are thinking like, oh, Orbit has been for a while. Can you actually build in Orbit? I haven't met like so many Orbit developers. I think like. Uh, the message is like, you can start building in Orbit today, right now. There's like no excuses. And if you want to do something like maybe like more simple, Orbit Visor is definitely the way to go. And you can start building something like in a couple of days. And it's like, oh, it's connecting to Orbit. And it's like, oh, that was easy. So I think right now you can already like do stuff. So it's like, right. You if you are passionate about Orbit, like now is like the time to start building things. So I, I know for sure we have in my audience kind of a fair number of engineers and, and hackers and, and people who are interested in Orbit or are just interested in kind of novel technological opportunities. Is there anything in particular maybe you, you could shout out to people, like if people wanted to build something with Urban Advisor, is there something you could build with Urban Advisor now that Urban Advisor is out there, something that someone could make that would be really cool? using the affordances of Urban Advisor? Yeah, uh, it's like super open. I can give like a crazy idea, but yeah, uh, I like crazy. sometimes uh, like uh, ideas and suppose like different to come, it's like, oh, I knew so many ideas. But for example, uh, there is a lot of like websites that you can actually have like anonymous identities. And um, you still can be anonymous, but you could be like a consistent anon by like going by your Orbit uh, ID. Okay. And for example, this could even be with like, for example, Google Docs, when you have like, open to the wall and you have like a random name. But if it's not random, it's like an anonymous that's consistent with your Orbit ID. So you can leave comments using like uh, your Orbit ID. Oh, cool. So you can already do that? Oh, uh, no, no. I'm, that I'm giving be, ideas. That needs to be built. Yeah, that needs to be built, right? Uh, yeah. So this is all about ideas of things that you can do. Like, got it. Got it. And what would that take? Would That would have to be a project within Google? No. Someone, or no? No. So uh, that could be like a Chrome extension that's going to be like injecting some code or like reading, for example, when you have the comments, uh, there could be like some specific strings that could be like interpreted by your extension and it could be replaced by your Orbit ID and even it could link like some, uh, got some it. information. Okay, got it. Very cool. So basically, Urban Advisor gives you the basic framework or foundation for being able to do these things, but people are going to have to code up the, the the specific integrations. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Cool. So that that that's a that's a that's great. Then that gives people a sense of uh, where they can take this next and and maybe start building more implementations of it. Cool. So maybe someone listening or watching will uh, you know take take you up on that. Hopefully, yeah. I would love to see more projects coming up in orbit, and that's what will make us happy. That uh, something that we build is like useful for other uh, builders. Okay. Awesome. Well, Nico, we covered a lot of ground today. This was really interesting uh, set of topics. Not often we get to talk about. Urbit and Cardano, uh, you know, and and all these different things all in one conversation. So this is really fun and I appreciate it. Was there anything else kind of you wanted to share with the Urbit community or with my audience or anything else on your mind that we didn't get to talk about? I wish I would have uh, talked a little bit more about Solana because I'm so excited about uh, what's going on in that ecosystem. Like, it's super interesting. Let's but... do it. I have, to, I have plenty of time. I wasn't sure if that was like a big talking point or not, but let's do it. I want to I want to hear it. So, so give us the bull case for Solana and what's most interesting uh, that's going on in Solana. Uh, Solana, again, like uh, all the different uh, consensus uh, protocols were like a little bit too similar. And Solana came out with the proof of history that works like in terms of like hatches that you are going to like put together. 
Uh, so you can create like proofs like really fast and so you can have like finality. I think it's like, uh, don't call me on this one, but I think it could be like around like 20 seconds. Like uh, it's not confirmation. You can have like a very fast confirmation. Confirmation in Solana is like around like 400 milliseconds, but finality that you're sure that this thing is not going to change. That's like around like 20 seconds. Uh, again, don't quote me on this one. And uh, the uh, throughput is like so fast, like 50,000 transactions per second. So this op op and it's like super cheap. So it opens up like this new like wall of like uh, possibilities. And especially for like gaming, I think it's going to be like really, really interesting because for gaming, you need like uh, like speed, you need like to be really cheap. And so I think like a lot of like games are actually going to be like launching in Solana. And I'm like super excited because that's something that I was like missing. And, and all the time it was like first in like Ethereum, we want to launch with games, but it has all these constraints. And there were like other projects that were like very marketing wise, like Tron, oh, we are for gaming or like EOS, but nothing ever happened. Actually, like for Solana, I, I've been like also reading about like uh, how are they implementing things and like, oh my God, that's so smart. And like, uh, I wouldn't have thought of that. It makes so much sense. And actually, I think like they got to like a really, really good product. Still uh, is evolving and obviously has trade off related to centralization, but I think it's still like really, really interesting. So if people are playing games on Solana, but they're logging in using their Urbit ID, you know, do you think there's a possible future where we see like video game usernames are like the Urbit usernames? You know, it's like exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that will be like my uh, our goal because we are like putting together. Uh, we are putting uh, bets on different like uh, uh, specific blockchains that are like actually pretty different. And if any of them like work out and we are involved with that ecosystem, guess what? Urbit's coming there. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I I could see one day you're playing video games and you're you're up against someone named like Fad Whip. Fun done, you know. <laughs> uh, that's that's really interesting. That's cool. Yeah, I think Solana. I think the case for Solana is more clear to people than maybe Cardano, which a lot of people see as as uh, more mystified because basically Solana is just super fast, and yeah. and it seems like it's it's gaining kind of network effects. So I think a lot of people can understand that Solana has a chance of being at least the the blockchain that dominates for use cases that require speed, and maybe don't need the decentralization as much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other kind of interesting cross applications uh, other than imagining Urbit usernames po maybe passing, uh, popping up in, the, in these <laughs> different in these different systems? Are there other um, interesting interactions we might we might see between Urbit and Web three or Urbit and, and blockchains? Yeah. Right now, uh, I already feel like a little bit old for this, but I still like sort of get it. Uh, so there is NFTs, and F NFTs are not a thing from only one chain it could be like in different chains so right now it's like really difficult to like send messages like hey i like your nft will you be open to sell it or like uh, having conversation and i think like messaging between like different blockchains uh, based on identities is something that maybe eventually could be like achieved through orbit in connection with wallets what do this mean i think wallets in the future are going to be like uh cross chain like uh that uh, it's not going to be like oh i'm changing from avalanche to ethereum or to arbitrum to Solana, but right, like you're just going to see all your different assets. You're going to be in which network they are. You can switch them, but also at the same time, uh, uh, there's going to be more explorers uh, related to NFTs. So if we have the wallets, we have the explorers, you're going to be able to like message random mm -hmm. people in the internet. So it's going to be like this like weird sort of like email that's going to be built in, uh, based on blockchain. Mm -hmm. And uh, for messaging and identities, I think Orbit is going to be like, the solution to go. I have seen other projects that are already trying to build something similar on top of Lightning or on top of like Solana. But again, I think like uh, I, I I have this little smirk because I'm like, oh, they're going to have all these issues that are going to release later on. And then they're going to start thinking about, oh, I need to do something like this. And that is like, oh, that looks a lot like Orbit. Interesting. Yeah. I know someone building a startup, in a kind of Web3 startup that's building the messaging layer on Matrix. Are you familiar with yeah. the Matrix protocol? I think the French government is using Matrix or something like that. Who is that? Uh, the French government. Oh, is that right? I think so. Yeah, well, there's some Web3 startups that are trying to build with that being the messaging layer. Do you, have, do you th Could that work or is that going to run into issues and they're going to need to switch to Urbit? I don't know that much about sure, Matrix. Sure, I'm curious. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. I have heard about it. Right, but... right. Fascinating, fascinating. So, okay. NFTs 
are very interesting because they're obviously blowing up and a lot of people think that nfts are uh the real kind of like public on-ramp that's gonna that's gonna get a lot of people large numbers of people kind of integrated into into web3 so that's very interesting and i was talking with james james from the point DAO last night uh there's there's this DAO that's basically kind of crowdsourcing galaxy ownership and urbit pretty interesting project and he was basically saying he's kind of an eth bull and he was basically saying I was just asking what what's most exciting about Urbit to him. And he was like, it would just be really cool if when you send crypto to someone, you can message them at the same time. He's like, it's so simple. He said it so simply. And it's like kind of so obvious when you think about it. But just you currently can't do that. Like it, it just would be really convenient and good to be able to message when sending crypto. Right. So if if Urbit were to do nothing other than be the messaging layer where crypto wallets can talk to each other before sending money. And you can kind of confirm the person you're talking to is the person you're sending money to. Um, that alone could be like a, a pretty profound and, and a significant contribution of value to the to the space. Right? Yeah, I completely agree. And we have seen that this like the approach that multiple like multi million dollar companies are trying to implement. Like for example, Facebook. Right. Right. So I think that I think that's that's very fascinating. And yeah, anything else about Solana or NFTs that are particularly interesting uh, avenues for for Urban integration? Do you see like Urbit, I don't know, hosting like NFT marketplaces or does Urbit become the place where NFT metadata is stored or something like this? Is there anything like that that is interesting to you or worth discussing or, or basically anything else that's on your mind that you wanted to talk about? Uh, I, I, this is a crazy thought and I don't know how much sense it makes. I'm still like trying to like put my thoughts together. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, using, uh, again, I don't know about this, even maybe I'm still learning about Orbit, so maybe there's like some technical things that don't make sense, but it would be pretty cool that you could use Orbit with IoT, uh, with your uh, with boons that are based on your planet. And you can like use like the processing power of Orbit to like, I don't know, do some cool stuff uh, with analyzing the data. So when you have, I think it's so sensitive to have like IoT things and maybe sending information to Amazon, uh, like, I don't know, it scares me. Even like, for example, I have like a speaker that could connect to Alexa and I have it off, like don't say anything. But other IoT things, I would love to have like control about them. And uh, not only the data is going to be connected to Orbit, but also they're going to be doing some processing. And like, I think like the moon approach uh, is like kind of like perfect for things like this. It's really interesting you say that because we talked about that in a podcast yesterday. There are people working on this, I think. Some guy named Pop Rocks. Did I get? Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, I, I think that might be his nickname. But um, <laughs> uh, some guy named Pop Rocks is apparently very interested in exactly that. Moons moons for IoT applications. So I'm going to try to rope him in here and, and hopefully learn more about that because it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, so, it's super cool. And yeah. also there is like other project. I don't know that much about it. It's called Helium, but for like giving internet to like IoT things. So also could play uh, pretty well together. Fascinating. Well, you've given us so much to, to think about, so many uh, possible threads to pull on for the future of urban de development. So I think a lot of people will find this interview very you know generative and, and inspiring. So it was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for sharing your time. And there was a lot of really interesting insights and I think opinions and perspectives that you've offered here that maybe are not very common in the Urbit ecosystem. So I think uh, people will enjoy this and get a lot out of it. Yeah. Well, thank you for the invitation. And I hope like, uh, people don't hear this conversation before the conference, so I don't get punched in the face for like uh, no, no, <laughs> some come after. Info. It'll come after. Is, oh, yeah, there, cool. is there anywhere you want to send people in particular? Uh, you want them to use Orbit Advisor? You want them to go to the website? Where do you want to send people? Yeah, please uh, check out Orbit Advisor and Orbit Dashboard and give us like feedback. Uh, what do you like? What you don't like? Which is like uh, even more interesting. Awesome. I'll put links to those things in the show notes so people watching or listening can uh, easily check those out. And thanks again, Nico. This is awesome. And that's a wrap. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.